Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, May 10th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. The queen of the establishment, Hillary Clinton, raked in nearly $75,000 in campaign contributions from Justice Department employees. So how can we trust the DOJ to bring a case against her? This is an urgent call for the appointment of a special counsel. Hillary for prison 2016. Then, the social justice warriors strike again. Police in Manchester conducted a terror drill with a fake ISIS suicide bomber shouting Allah Akbar during a training exercise. What followed was a deeply offended Muslim community, plus a warning to parents worldwide. Sextortion of children on the internet. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Police in the UK have been training officers for an ISIS-style attack. Uh, they've been going through these terror drills, similar to those that killed hundreds of people in Paris and Brussels. Well, now they're facing backlash because they've been forced to issue a groveling apology to the PC police after the mock suicide bomber screamed Allah Akbar. So people are saying, well, this is Islamophobic for assuming that the terrorists would be Muslim. Hello, they are training the police to respond to the most likely scenario. Now, footage of this terror exercise showed a mass suicide bomber. He stormed into a mall and yelled, Allah Akbar, uh, before fireworks exploded. So, of course, this represents the suicide belt being detonated. 800 bloody volunteers acted out being killed or injured as armed officers swept the mall for other jihadis. But then all of a sudden, all of these PC police, they force the officers there to apologize for being Islamophobic and for assuming that the jihadists would be Muslim. Hello, nobody else is blowing themselves up. Nobody is going around saying, Jesus loves you, and blowing themselves up in the mall. And a lot of people on Twitter, of course, are going after the police, calling them uh, weak and spineless in the face of the PC police. A lot of people stuck up for him saying, you know, there's no need to apologize. You were right and followed the pattern of Brussels, Paris, Lee Rigby, the PC brigade needs a reality check. Um, and then someone said, maybe in the future training, the suicide bomber could shout, I'm blowing myself up for a generic terrorist cause. Or someone said, you know, maybe they'll have him yell Merry Christmas or something, because that's what jihadists tend to yell, of course. And, you know, if you're doing a terror training drill to prepare your police officers to respond to an ISIS style attack, you know, let's let's be real here. So this whole hysteria has made its way to the upper echelons of our foremost scientific research institutes here, even in America. This is coming out of MIT. There is a, an event that was hosted this week. Is Islamophobia accelerating global warming? That's right. This was at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a speaker argued that Islamophobia was responsible for the acceleration of global warming. Um, it, the talk examined the relation between Islamophobia as the dominant form of racism today and the ecological crisis. And now the speaker also has a book coming out soon entitled, Are Racists Responsible for Global Warming? So this is just thoroughly exhausting, but you know, I bet you guys are just gonna rush out to get a copy of that book. And theologian George Igler summed up the whole ludicrousness of this issue when he tweeted, this lecture took place at MIT, the world's foremost scientific research establishment on Monday at 5 p.m., seriously. So I guess we can all see that science has absolutely been compromised. And it is now indeed feelings over fact. Uh, Islam is a belief system, it's not a race. And apparently now, if you are irrationally fearful of that belief system, then you are accelerating global warming and you're probably a racist and a terrorist as well. Now, something else crazy, you know, that we all on the sidelines are kind of watching saying, why isn't anyone taking Hillary Clinton to task? Well. The Attorney General here in the United States of America, she was asked yesterday when she made this big to-do about the bathroom bill, she was asked as a side note, 
you know, if the clock had run out against taking action against Clinton in light of the advanced election schedule. And she said, you know, I can't make any prediction about the timing of a final resolution to the Hillary Clinton email investigation. We do all of our reviews, investigate any matter carefully, thoroughly, and efficiently. And when the matter is ready for a resolution, she make a rec recommendation. But, you know, she can't give a prediction right now. Sorry. They're just really busy, and they're going to allow Hillary Clinton, of course, to just skate through and become elected. And, and who knows? It could it possibly have anything to do with the fact that Hillary Clinton has raked in nearly $75,000 from the Justice Department employees. That's right. This is the agency that's going to be deciding whether or not to act if the FBI recommends charges against Clinton or her aides following this investigation uh, into her private email server. Justice Department employees have given Clinton far more money than her rivals, uh, Bernie Sanders and even Donald Trump. This is according to a review of federal campaign contributions. So nearly 75,000, you know, no conflict of interest there. I'm sure those people are going to be incredibly fair and thorough in their investigation, like the attorney general says. But, you know, who cares? <laughs> about criminals like this. Who cares if she's gonna be now in the highest office in the land? Uh, on the Alex Jones Show today, David Knight spoke with an HSBC whistleblower who said that he specifically sent the Attorney General information that would have shown her the criminal activity going on in HSBC. He sent this information to her as well, all up and down the chain of command. And then when asked about it, Loretta Lynch said, oh yeah, you know, I did get that memo, but I didn't really do anything about it. You know, so she, she's too busy to go after globalist banksters, um, you know, who are responsible for trillions and trillions of dollars worth of criminal activity and crime. She doesn't have time for that. She doesn't have time to take down Clinton. But what she does have time for is the bathroom wars. And of course, you know, she took to her soapbox yesterday to say that the whole bathroom wars thing that's going on in North Carolina is similar to the Jim Crow laws that we saw in the past here in the country, which is, of course, absurd. And as another great article out of The Federalist points out, the scale of these events are in no sense comparable. Jim Crow laws passed by states and localities that enforced racial segregation. They stripped millions of African Americans, not only of their liberty, but their dignity. And the state punished them for their skin color, kept them uneducated and poor, and they could not escape their situation without more government interference. And of course, under this North Carolina law, no one is stopping a private company or a coffee shop or a big box store from having any kind of bathroom set up that they desire all North Carolina is saying is, hey, federal government, there isn't even any actual definition of what a transgender person actually is. So maybe you should get that in order first before you start making all of these federal mandates on businesses to do something that even people dealing with transgender issues don't even know how to identify themselves. So there needs to be some sort of a federal identification. So it's just completely odd and very strange that you have the attorney general likening this to the Jim Crow South. And, uh, you know, it's also kind of a, a big news flash or a blinding light to me when you see that they're getting all the plebes on the ground riled up about something like the bathroom bills um, and then completely looking away when big time criminals are getting away uh, with real crime and breaking the law. Now, one thing that will be <laughs> getting probed if Hillary Clinton becomes the president, uh, the whole extraterrestrial UFO cover-up. And when she was asked about UFOs um, during a late-night TV interview with Jimmy Kimmel, Hillary Clinton said, you know, if I get elected, I'm definitely going to look into it. And she's vowed that barring any national security threats, she would open up the government files on the subject. And this has made... UFO enthusiasts, they're elated, and they declare Mrs. Clinton the first ET candidate. So, you know, that might be the one good thing to come out of a Clinton presidency. She promised to get to the bottom of it, and she says, I think we may have been visited already. We don't know for sure. Now, some people who definitely agree with that, of course, are ancient civilization, and the evidence of that is in all the monuments that they've constructed. Well, now a very smart schoolboy appears to have discovered a lost Mayan city hidden deep in the jungles of Mexico. He used a new method of matching stars to the location of temples on Earth. And he spent hours poring over diagrams of constellations and maps of known 
uh, large Mayan cities. And this 15-year-old boy said he was really surprised and excited when he realized that the most brilliant stars of the constellations matched the largest Mayan cities. Hundreds of years of scholarship, no other scientist had ever found such a correlation. He studied 22 different constellations, and he found that they matched the location of 117 Mayan cities scattered throughout Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And then when he applied his theory to a 23rd constellation, he found that two of the stars already had cities attached to them, uh, but the third star was unmatched, and that was when he went to Google Maps, and he projected the constellation onto the ground, and he was able to find that indeed there was some sort of an elevation there, and the Canadian Space Agency trained their satellite telescopes, and so now they're going to be doing some further investigation, and we may be finding another lost Mayan city, and he, of course he said he became really interested in this after the Mayan, um, reading about the Mayans and their predictions with what would happen in uh, 2012. See, this is the kind of thing that kids should be doing with the internet, just brilliant kids and engaging in their curiosity. Instead, we have to now tell parents to warn their kids about sextortion. This is a growing online problem worldwide. Um, it's victimizing students up all the way into college age and beyond, as well as it's really the fastest growing threat to children. More than 60% of people surveyed said that uh, this type of online enticement of minors is increasing. This is where uh, kids will go into chat rooms or they'll use their Kick app on their phone and they will have someone who could be in an entirely other country entice them into sending sexually explicit photos or videos of themselves um, over the internet and then they're extorted for money. So you have to warn your kids about these things with the internet. This is just insane and all sorts of terrible and bizarre things are happening with this. Parents, you can't trust your kids to be alone with their technology. Now stick around because Joe Biggs and Jafari Jackson are going to be in studio with the news blitz. On November 5th, 2015, the TPP was finally released to the public. On the very same day, President Obama declared he would sign it. Twelve countries participated in negotiations for the TPP. All 12 signed the TPP on February 4th, 2016. The agreement will enter into force after ratification by all signatories, if ratified within two years. If the agreement is not ratified by all before February 4th, 2018, it will enter into force after ratification by at least six states, which together have a GDP of more than 85% of the GDP of all signatories. For the time being, and fortunately, it's an election year and Obama is a lame duck president. It will be a photo finish for the TPP within the confines of Obama's temporary reign. Why can't why can't Obama do something that actually helps Americans? Oh yeah, that's right. He's not really supporting anything to do with America or the Constitution. That's like for pathetic human scum. The TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a so-called trade agreement that basically creates a legalized one-world government, a legal bulwark into the sovereignty of nations, delivering poisonous food shipped right to your local grocery store. And those prescriptions that you desperately needed will now be unaffordable as Big Pharma gets all it ever wished for. And that's just the TPP. There are two other heads to this Hydra that we are aware of. The ultra-secretive TISA, or Trade in Services Agreement, intended to be classified for five years after being signed Fortunately for us, key portions of it were exposed by WikiLeaks. TISA essentially clears the way for the multinational corporations to regulate the management of public laws. TISA would also privatize state-owned enterprises. And let's not forget the knockout punch thrown by the TTIP, or the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, essentially forming a more imperfect union between the United States and the European Union. The profound changes on the horizon are why the puppets of the multinational corporations felt it was time to clue future generations in on the wonderful devastation they have in store for their future. Of course, explaining it bluntly isn't what they had in mind. They felt they should sugarcoat the truth with total bullshit. America is a better place today than it was when I graduated from college. 
It also happens to be better off than when I took office, but that's a longer story. The point is you need allies in a democracy. It's not a black or white thing. Go to any country where the give and take of democracy has been repealed by one party rule, and I will show you a country that does not work. There are no walls big enough to stop people from anywhere, tens of thousands of miles away, who are determined to take their own lives while they target others. So I think that everything that we've lived and learned tells us that we will never come out on top if we accept advice from soundbite salesmen and carnival barkers who pretend the most powerful country on earth can remain great by looking inward and hiding behind walls at a time that technology has made that impossible to do and unwise to even attempt. The future demands from us something more than a nostalgia for some rose-tinted version of a past that did not really exist in any case. And I think that everyone here, especially the class of 2016, understands that viscerally, internally, intellectually. You're about to graduate into a complex and borderless world. Congratulations, class of 2016. Your future of endless financial aid payments, robot replacements, and a multinational screw job to your chosen career, diet, national sovereignty, and healthcare is on the verge of being set in stone, on the fast track to be guaranteed to begin in 2018. So are you still convinced that Obama was a great president? You all have some work to do. So enjoy the party. Because you're going to be busy. John Bound for Infowars.com. And welcome back to the Nightly News. I'm joined in studio now by Joe Biggs, Jakari Jackson here in the lead chair. Now, Joe, I want to start off our news blitz talking about something I know is very near and dear to your heart, the subject of beer. We have seen these social justice warriors. They come after everything. They talk about the American flag while in the United States of America. They say you can't wear a uh, American flag T-shirt on Cinco de Mayo when you go to the schools in California. And now they're actually coming after uh, Budweiser, of all things, because they have a new line of beer coming out that's going to have the tagline, America, on the can. Yeah, people want to get drunk on America and freedom. I support that uh, through in and throughout. You know, pretty much if you cut me open, I'm going to bleed red, white, and blue in probably some beer, beer as well. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's, pretty, it's, it's a pretty catchy slogan. I mean, you're going to be drinking America. I mean, it's, I don't see anything wrong with it. But, I mean, I, I'm in full support of anything that's going to piss off social justice warriors, make them cry, crawl into a safe space. And it's only going to be temporary, right? It's only until what the election starts. Yeah, that's my understanding. It's uh, kind of a seasonal beer. So I guess the election season, if you will, they're going to have this special beer out with a special label, limited time deal. It's got like E Pluribus Unum on it, 1776. Things are like that, yeah. I'm all about it. And I mean, when you think about this stuff, the most ridiculous things these social justice warriors want to come up with, uh, they're, they're banning, uh, Paul put out, the article the other day, how they're banning ads with attractive women. You know, so you got some uh, some fitness product that you want to have, and you have an attractive woman. A well, you well don't want to make the fat people feel guilty. I, I just don't understand. It's they want to ban everything. It's because they say it's inclusive and progressive and accepting the other people's thoughts and points of view until they actually meet somebody with a different I mean, thought I or mean, point of view. I mean, it's not healthy to be like Victoria's Secret runway skinny Skinny, model. But I mean, the ones that they put in most of these magazines are pretty healthy looking chicks. They're fit. Yeah, they're not. That's good. That's a nice, healthy lifestyle. We shouldn't be promoting someone sitting around eating Cheetos all day like I do and drinking America. (laughs) (laughs) All right, right, let's move on to something here that's a little more serious in tone. I know you got some things as well. Uh, But first, let's talk about Henry Kissinger, the war criminal, uh, many people would say. Just a few things he's done carpet bombing Cambodia also supporting uh, Pakistan's genocide, and on and on and on. And now they have an article from Vox, of all things, not Fox, but Vox, V-O-X, and they're saying that they shouldn't be honoring Henry Kissinger with an award. I mean, they gave Obama an a award. A peace, yeah. peace prize, okay. So. You know, right after, you know, bombing people with drones. So, I mean, it, it doesn't really surprise me that this guy is going to get something, you know. Yeah, when you think about all the atrocities that go on, you know, they'll tell you all the good things that people do, but they don't want to mention the bad things, like, uh, as they point out in this article, many things more than I have time to I'm go sure over. if there's an award for truthfulness, Hillary Clinton would probably be the, the first in line for that one, <laughs> you know? All right, all right. The, the route we're going with these awards. All right, Joe, so what do you have over there? 
I mean, I, I saw something today that Paul put up. I thought it was really interesting. MIT event is Islamophobia accelerating global warming. Oh. I guess our hate for, you know, Islam is, is so powerful that we are accelerating this global warming issue. It says, Massachusetts Institute of Technology hosted an event last night during which speaker Ghassan Haj argued that Islamophobia was responsible for the acceleration of global warming. I mean, the stuff that we see every day is the BS is accelerating, if anything. Yeah, now, I'm not familiar with that article, but I have seen recent reports where they talk about if these guys had jobs, as we've seen the people in the administration say, they'd be out there farming and doing other things and not out there shooting bullets and blowing up bombs, which I guess, in their case, uh, raises up global warming. I guess. I don't know. I, I just think this is some of the most ridiculous stuff ever, so we'll just get rid of that now. Uh, Mexico won't take Cuban migrants, tells Panama to dump them on U.S. border. Those dirty little racists. This is an article up by Kit Daniels. Uh, Mark, or Mexico is allowing Panama to dump nearly 4,000 Cuban migrants on the U.S. border, revealing the hypocrisy of Mexican officials as they attack Trump's immigration policies. And then you also have uh, ex-president of Mexico, Vicente Fox, Fox, coming out today, posting a picture, flipping off uh, Donald Trump, saying he's not going to build that wall. Meanwhile, they have a wall in the south part of Mexico, and they're not allowing Cubans to come in. Who's the racist? And that's the thing I always hear about this wall issue. Like, I'm not a fan of the wall. I think it's a bad idea, especially since Trump would be paid to build the wall. Of course, he wants to be 10 feet taller. But, I mean, all that aside, if you want to talk about a clear racial issue, if you go down to the border of Mexico to get into Mexico, you're going to be stopped at a border if you yes. go through a legal checkpoint. If you want to go to Canada, if you want to go to some foreign country, uh, you're going to be stopped at the border, at customs, all this deal. So to say that the simple fact of having a border is racist is really ridiculous. I, I think a border is not a good idea as far as the wall mm -hmm. because, you know, Josh Owens and I actually took a trip down to Arizona yes. to Hereford and spoke with this guy, Glenn Spencer, who actually has some amazing technology, technology so good that the government shut it down, his, his contract with Northrop Grumman, and said, no, we, we can't use it because it actually worked. Whenever you have something that works, they, they don't want it. And this technology, what it does is he has these seismic technology, these readers that go down to the ground. And as someone approaches from Mexico into the U.S., those readers start going off. And once it gets to a certain like decibel or whatever, it opens up this thing and sends off this drone, which then sends real-time footage live of whoever it is coming over the border, the number, the sex, mm -hmm. guns or not, drugs, whatever it is, gives that information to the Border Patrol to a feed they have, like in a security room, that saves you money on not having to build a wall. Mm -hmm. It informs the Border Patrol into what they're getting themselves into before they go and approach these people. If they know they're about to get into a gunfight or yes. there's drugs, coyotes, human smuggling, all that stuff. I think that's the most cost effective and best way. And yet we can't get that. Well, it doesn't. It's too cost effective. Like you said, it works too well. They'd much rather build a wall, have this never ending construction project than to have something that actually And then someone works. can climb over or dig, or like we saw when I was in Arizona as well, these cartels would come in with uh, plasma cutters, cut down sections of the fence, mm -hmm. then use the truck to drop it down slowly, drive over, take their shipments up to I-10, drive back, pull the fence back up, and oh, weld wow. it up. Wow, that's really creative. <laughs> I gotta give it to them on that. Uh, now, as we're talking about some illegal activity, I wanna talk about a guy who recently got caught after being on the run for nearly 50 years. Uh, this is Robert uh, Stakowicz. Uh, he escaped from a Georgia prison way back when he's been on the run. Uh, he is spending a lot of time up in the Northeast, and he eventually got caught here recently. So uh, my question to you, Joe Biggs, after 48 years on the run for robbery, I, I don't believe it was uh, violent robbery, just robbery in general, um, would it be worth it to send a task for, force after a guy like this? I mean... He obviously got caught because he's old and tired, more than likely, and kind of just not really caring at this point in time. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a waste of resources, really. I mean, if there's no violence involved, no one was hurt, it was just money taken, after that long, who cares? Let's yeah. get over it move on. Let's, let's spend our money on something else, like making Budweiser America. <laughs> All right, I got one more, then we'll finish up with what you have. Uh, Lyft and Uber. Uh, it's an issue, hot topic here in the city of Austin, Texas. I know we have many people not from Texas, so... Basically, what the situation is, is Lyft and Uber have decided to, quote, pause their operations here in the city of Austin, Texas, because of a city council uh, proposal, city council vote. Uh, basically, the city council was saying we want to regulate them more like a taxicab company. And also, there was the reasons of public safety. 
Now, this is my argument, briefly. Um, I've been to these city council meetings about things like dog walking initiatives, and just out of nowhere, they'll bring up you know, something like uh, the train. We want to build the train. We want to make the train more expensive. So the city council has a vested interest in keeping Lyft and Uber out because that's money not being taken in by the city. Mm -hmm. Also, you have, uh, when you have these big events, you have people who make money off of parking, all, all these number of other things that goes way beyond just a simple public safety issue of these guys having fingerprints or not. Yeah, it's all about the money. Whenever you look at something like this, one of these drastic measures, it, you just got to follow the money trail. And at the end of the day, that's what they want. They feel like they're not getting enough money. When if Lyft and Uber came in, you know, DUI rates went down, all that revenue is gone. Uh, they want to keep people in their transportation that they can make money off of. That's what it's all about. They don't care about public safety at the end of the day. They don't care if you get a DUI or not. They want you to because they get, they get that money and they can use it to buy cooler toys and build a a train station or something that we don't really even need. All right, uh, with the minute we have left, uh, what do you have, Joe Biggs? Uh, one dead, three hurt after stabbing spree at Germany train station. This is an article at Fox News. One person was killed and three others were injured Tuesday morning when a knife-wielding man attacked people indiscriminately at a commuter rail station outside of Munich, Germany. Uh, guess what the guy was yelling when this happened? Oh, man, don't. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to say it. You know, that's yeah. basically the uh, the trend nowadays. It says, police spokesman Carl Hines said the assailant who was arrested at the scene expressed political motivations. Hmm. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, we see a lot of these things. Um, it, it's a growing trend and it's very unfortunate. Yeah, tranny but. spitting on someone's face. That's a political, political, political motivation. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Joe Big. Stay tuned. We'll be back right after this with the rest of the show. We have joining us now uh, John Cruz, who is also a whistleblower, and his testimony, uh, and of course this has been followed quite a bit uh, by Jerome Corsi. He's done a lot of uh, interviews with uh, John Cruz, and to introduce the subject, we're going to play an excerpt from an interview that Jerome Corsi had, uh, but he blew the whistle on what was going on at HSBC, sent information to Loretta Lynch, who is now our Attorney General. Uh, she never called him back. She admitted that she had the information, and she never did anything with it, and it became part of the confirmation hearings for Loretta Lynch. And then we found out after she became attorney general that uh, she let these guys get away with bank robbery again because it is bank robbery when the banks rob us. Let's play a clip of the interview with Jerome Corsi and John Cruz. So these are papers that you pulled out of the bank's computer system, is that this correct? This is right straight from the bank's computer system. And you pulled these because you suspected they were fraudulent transactions, is that I correct? I pulled these because I thought they were suspicious activities taking place, and these same documents I brought to senior security within the bank. And John, you realize what you're saying is that bank employees are involved then in a pattern of illegal activity, is that That's what correct. Saying? That's what I'm saying. All right, now you can see the rest of that report at his website. That's worldbankingworldfraud.com. It's just a sample of that. And, of course, uh, John Cruz has been a uh, vice president, a senior business relations manager for HSBC. He blew the whistle on criminal money laundering. And yet, of course, as we've seen multiple times now, with not only HSBC but with many other large banks, they are too big to jail they don't shut. They don't pull their charter. Nobody goes to jail, and they get a fine that is incredibly small. Joining us now is John Cruz. Thank you, John, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I want to get a little bit of a idea of what you saw there, but before we do, the, your your testimony figured in prominently in the confirmation hearings of Loretta Lynch, who replaced Eric Holder as Attorney General, and of course we'd seen the uh, Holder administration of the Department of Justice give a wrist slap to HSBC and others, and then people questioned her on the information that you gave that uh, Jerome Corsi published at uh, WND. And then this became part of our confirmation here. When she was confirmed as Attorney General, the very first thing she did, and this is a report from uh, Corsi at WND, the very first major action she did as Attorney General was to allow five big banks, Citibank, J.P. Morgan, Chase, Barclays, Royal Bank of Scotland, and UBS, to plead guilty to felony charges for manipulating the foreign exchange currency markets. That's called Forex, for those of you who uh, do this on a regular basis, and pay $6 billion in fines. Now, that may sound like a lot of money to people, but to put that in perspective, Corsi points out that the Bank of International Settlement estimated that the market is averaging $5.3 in trading per day in April of 2013. So 
to put this in perspective, let's say that you go in and you rob a bank and uh, you get a million dollars and they catch you and you get a fine of a thousand dollars. Are you going to keep doing it? Of course you're going to keep doing it. Yes. And these banks keep doing it. And it gets even worse than that because it's like you were robbing people for a million dollars per day and you get a one-time fee of a thousand dollars. Of course they're going to keep doing this. Uh, John, tell us what you saw there as a bank manager uh, that you were blowing the whistle on. What I saw is I saw many transactions taking place around the world. The bank was conducting the transactions using the public's identity, using their social security numbers, using their tax IDs for their corporations, and laundering money around the world for drugs, for terrorists, for paying off politicians. It's just trillions and trillions of dollars, never mind billions, it's trillions of dollars. And it goes on every day. Now, how did you see this uh, in your capacity as uh, uh, a bank relations manager? What, what type of uh, indications did you get to see that this was going on? Whenever you've seen launch transactions, hundred thousands, a million, 10 million, 800 million, you're supposed to file suspicious activity reports to confirm these transactions. Mm -hmm. The bank would never file the suspicious activity reports when I reported to them, the executives. The executives would leave the accounts open. They say, yes, there are, no, there are no entities to these accounts, but leave them open. They're not doing nothing with them. They make money off these accounts. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, we saw a similar thing happen when I talked to Everett Stern. He was in the money laundering division that they created after they were caught the first time. And he said there were key, uh, key terms that they had in their database that would flag certain types of transactions out of these suspicious activities reports. And he noticed that as you know, these things were not getting flagged and he looked at the database and there would be like a space inserted in the name or a period inserted to the name. So it was something that was very deliberate. They didn't want it to get flagged by the software. And now you're telling us that even when it was flagged because it was such a large transaction, they would just pass this through. That is correct. But the idea was, is they're using the public's identity on their escrow accounts. They create accounts that are called unidentified and they're checking accounts, so they do not report them to the IRS. Mm. They use them to transfer money. They'll keep them open for 30 days, transfer all the money around the world, what they want to transfer in that account, and then close it the day before it was open wow. to eliminate the transactions once the money has passed. Wow. And, of course, it, it occurs to me that when we see the massive open borders in this country and the people who are coming in, and uh, that gives them a very – plausible deniability for all of this because they can say, hey, this is just somebody who came in, they're undocumented, so we create these bogus accounts and everything. But you're pointing out it goes even beyond that. I mean, that's a very uh, that, that's a very plausible thing for them to be able to hide this money deliberately. But then they go in and they even uh, delete these accounts prior to their creation date so they uh, disappear completely, just flush Correct. them down the memory hole. Yes. Wow. This is what they do. This is how they wipe out transactions. Once the money is done, the crime is committed, they eliminate the evidence. You know, I find that interesting because as we were just talking to Michael Schneider about the meeting that was held recently with all these major banks talking about how they want to move to digital cash. We're going to talk about this uh, later in the program, an article from Wired Magazine about how a former band member from ABBA is trying to sell this in Sweden. And, of course, he's got a lot of uh, street creds, I guess, <laughs> Uh, in, in Sweden still. I'm not a big ABBA fan, but it, uh, there's a lot of people in Sweden, I guess, still are. But he's trying to portray this as some as cash being something that is strictly the black market. But what you're pointing out here is that this was all done electronically, and it becomes even more easy uh, for criminals, especially the ones in the banks, to hide and to launder money if we have a cashless society, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's totally correct. And the criminals own HSBC Bank. Now, tell it's us, around, it's a, tell us right. what happened with your, your whistleblowing to Loretta Lynch, because we've had a whole series of articles that Jerome Corsi did about how uh, you contacted her. Uh, she never uh, replied any of this response. And then uh, you gave this information to senators, and they brought it up to her again at the confirmation hearing. Tell us a little bit about that chronology. Well, sending everything over to the Department of Justice, went over to Eric Holder. It went to Eric, um, excuse me, it went to Eric Holder, and it went to Loretta Lynch. Both did nothing, refused to do anything. Now, I have talked, documented and recorded conversations with law enforcement, with Congress officials, Senate Judiciary Committee, and as you see on my website, World Bank and World Fraud, there is a CD now with those recordings on it to the world so they can listen to what's going on. 
but wow. they, they did nothing. And they are actually, it feels like it's, they're part of the crime of what's going on. Even with voice recordings of executives at the bank saying we pay off government <laughs> officials. Yeah, absolutely. They're part of it. Absolutely. And that's a key part that, that we all need to understand, but it's important that we get this information out in the public. I mean, we can see for the longest time, you know, that when they give them these small wrist slaps, when they ignore this, and as I point out, they can allow these people to rig a trillion dollar markets. They can allow them to launder money to drug cartels and to terrorists. And yet Loretta Lynch gets all upset about the bathroom laws in North Carolina. That's what she's focused on. She's not going to focus on the real crime. And of course, we have to lose all of our Bill of Rights. We have to lose all of our privacy for these same people that they tell us are the security threats, that are the danger to us, the drug cartels, the terrorists. And yet they are the ones who are financing and giving them that money. Uh, Mr. Cruz, tell us again uh, what you think we should take away from this. What are your concerns for society in terms of uh, how, we, how do we, how do we uh, correct this? How do we uh, do something about this? my opinion, we need to vote out the individuals that are in office, the corrupt individuals. They need to go. We need people in office, new, fresh, that are here for the American people. We do not need people in office collecting money from lobbyists through money laundering, through terrorists, through drugs. I mean, no presidential campaign should be allowed to collect money from a terrorist organization whatsoever if you're totally illegal. Well, we knew that the Never Trump movement meant ready for Hillary because the Republicans have now shifted their donations to the Clinton campaign now that Ted Cruz is out of the presidential race. One of those donors is Renaissance Technology. They spent over 13 million on Cruz's campaign. Now they're pouring millions into Clinton's coffers. Her campaign is signaling to Republican donors that Hillary represents your values better than Trump. And this is the progressive outlet Common Dreams who's reporting. This is a striking admission, one that comes in the midst of an ongoing contest with opponent Bernie Sanders, who has, of course, questioned Clinton's commitment to progressive causes and has criticized her for caving under the temptations of corporate cash. So, of course, it's the presidential election year, and as we can uh, expect, she's going to shift to a more moderate platform um, to attract GOP donors as she focuses her attention away from Bernie Sanders and on to Donald Trump. So, like we've said, there is no practical difference between establishment Republicans and Democrats. But you know what? Don't count Ted Cruz out just yet. Now, uh, Cruz has said that he is considered reviving his campaign if he wins the Nebraska primary. And this is he's going to unsuspend his campaign if he wins the GOP primary Tuesday. This is despite the fact that he was mathematically eliminated on April 26th. So we can expect a <laughs> zombie Ted Cruz campaign to come out against t uh, Donald Trump. And now Cruz operatives, of course, are planning to stack the rules and the platform committees at the RNC convention. So, you know, they're not out of the game. This was on Sunday. This is a top Cruz aide who sent out a letter to convention delegates stating that it is still possible to advance a conservative agenda at the convention. To do that, it is imperative that we fill the rules and platform committees with strong conservative voices like yours. This is Ken Cuccinelli writing, and he says that means you need to come to the national convention and support others in coming. And they said, you know, it's very important to make it not appear to be underhanded. It can't appear as though we are pulling a stunt at this convention. So they are ready to stack the rules and all the platform committees at the RNC convention. One of the big things that they're looking at uh, is to change a rule that was implemented in 2012 by supporters of candidate Mitt Romney at the time. They were wanting to make it more difficult to place a candidate's name in nomination. So now they're going in. They want to get in there and repeal this because, of course, every four years it is changed at that time. And you know what? Even though he's suspended his campaign, he's already come out and said that, you know, hey, if he wins, he could unsuspend it. And like we've seen, they sort of change the rules uh, as it sees fit for the establishment. Now, our reporter there who's going to be covering the RNC and the DNC, Richard Reeves, has more. Richard Reeves with Infowars.com. It is Monday, May 9th, 2016. And right behind me, you can see the K. Bailey Hutchison Convention Center here in Dallas, Texas. 
where we are about to see the Texas State Convention kick off here on Thursday. So folks, the contested convention is on right now. Is it very likely that the establishment is going to win this contested convention and be able to elbow Donald Trump out of the nomination of the Republican Party? I don't think so. I think that Donald Trump has got the inside, the inside lane on that last stretch race here for the next month and a half or two months going into the RNC in Cleveland. And so barring that a lot of Trumpsters do not get out and vote in the upcoming elections, because that's another concern is we heard Donald Trump call for people to not get out and vote. But West Virginia, of course, he backtracked on that. And he said, hey, tomorrow's West Virginia, Tuesday's West Virginia. Everybody needs to go out and vote. And that's exactly what needs to happen is all these upcoming states, they should double and triple down their efforts and get even more people to vote and more importantly, to participate in the delegate process and end up showing up to their Senate district conventions, county conventions, state conventions, and ultimately to the Republican National Convention because that is exactly where if the establishment sees they have a majority of delegates, then watch out because they will play the rules game as many of y'all heard recently, Paul Ryan is slated to be the convention chair in Cleveland. Now, the way that'll work is those delegates have to vote him in as the permanent chair. The convention starts out with a temporary chairman. We don't know exactly who that temporary chairman might be. My guess is it'll probably be Ryan's Priebus would be the temporary chair that would start out the convention. And then those delegates of that convention have to vote in a permanent chairman of that convention, which that chairman has almost godlike power over the convention. I mean, he could sit there and say, all right, how many yeas, how many nays? And he alone by himself says, oh, yeah, the yeas have it. Or, oh, yes, the nays have it. Well, you know what? <laughs> they could be 75% yeas and 25% nays. And he'd say, well, the nays will have the vote on whatever the issue is, whether rules, resolutions, you name it. So the chairman has extraordinary powers in the Republican National Convention in Cleveland. In my view and in many people's view at this point, Paul Ryan should recuse himself of even being in the running for chairman of the Cleveland Convention, the RNC Convention in July here in 2016. With that, this is Richard Reeves with Infowars.com with more reports upcoming and make sure to stay tuned in to The Alex Jones Show on Infowars.com. Premiering this week on The Alex Jones Show. I was propagandized as a kid to believe that everything America did was great. For news is ready-made propaganda. The world is a vampire. And like a lot of people, as I got into the world in the 70s and 80s, I realized that wasn't true. But I do believe America is better than any other political and social system that's ever been created in the world. So I don't care what your trendy argument, I don't care what your hashtag argument is. If you do not stand for free speech, you do not stand for America. That means you want something else. And if you think your something else is going to be better than America, I'm here to tell you you're wrong. I can't believe we're even having this discussion, if, if you can understand why I say that to you humbly. To be talking in America about, in 2016, you know, about Mao's a good idea and a socialist is running for president, and that's okay. I mean, that's just crazy to me. You know, obviously, I listen to you, and I, I listen to Alex, and I listen to David Knight and Jakari. I mean, you guys do a fine job of identifying the factual route. And as I once told Alex, literally sitting in this exact spot, you don't always have to be right. You just have to have the right intention to want to get to the truth. As long as you want to get to the truth and that's your intention, that's fine. But what I would say to you, and I say this very plainly to you, is that most people don't care about facts. Most people do not care about facts. I work in the entertainment business. The people in the entertainment business do not care about facts. They only care about facts when it involves a gross. And to be participating not only as a at the citizen level, but then also be a, a public person and be part of the zeitgeist at different times to be used and abused positively and negatively within the systems that exist today. Billy Corgan, Smashing Pumpkins. Homie Simpson, smiling politely. You know, my kids think you're the greatest. And thanks to your gloomy music, they finally stopped dreaming of a future I can't possibly provide. And see how my participation um, is, is a constant decision making between either, either my helping and my hurting, am I informing or am I actually enslaving. You don't see how you've been engineered and steered and 
people are heavily invested in convincing you of something. We all know the, the advertising model. Uh, women very much understand from a very young age, you start being told, you gotta look like this, you gotta think like this, you gotta do this in your hair, blah, blah, blah. Young men, it comes a little bit later. Okay, we all understand that and we don't, it doesn't really bother us. We like when a clever ad manipulates us to want us to buy a certain product or something. What we don't realize is, think about people who have trillions on the line getting you to believe a lie or lean you a certain way so that they can achieve some end that's 10 years down the road that you don't even have the read for. How do we kind of see through that knowing of an evolutionary step that we as humans need to take? I mean, it's pretty remarkable that like literally, okay, I'm, I'm talking to you, right? I could say a one word right now that would destroy my career. I could use the wrong racial epithet or say the wrong thing to you or look down at the wrong part of your body and be castigated and it's a meme and I'm a horrible person. You have to start by separating the truth. I think admitting to yourself your own truth is always a good place to start. Rock star Billy Corgan on the fascist attacks on free speech. Premiering this week on The Alex Jones Show. Thanks for watching the show tonight. We'll see you here again tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central.